Fish stocks in the northeast Atlantic are under pressure. Fishermen must catch fish, but too many of them are below the legal minimum landing sizes and so have to be discarded. The destruction of fish, which would otherwise have grown and increased future stocks, is a serious problem for European fisheries. When we throw away young fish, we're throwing away the future. So, what can we do about it? While well, scientists here at the Marine Laboratory in Aberdeen have been pioneering the design of selective fishing nets. These are nets which allow juvenile fish to escape and grow. The scientists have been doing this work for years on commercial fishing boats and on their own research vessels, like this one, the Scotia. There's worldwide interest in their research and it's prompted many others to get involved. Now you may have heard of strange sounding things like square mesh cod ends, black tunnels and weird sounding gizmos from other countries including escape panels and sorting grids. We're going to take a trip on Scotia to find out what these things are, whether they work and if they really can be used by fishermen to help conserve stocks and make sure there's still a future for the industry. Okay John? Aye, come on, let's go. This is the sort of net that's usually used to catch fish which live on the seabed. Now, if we get a design of this right, it makes fishery management a bit less fraud. The catch builds up in the cod ends, so that's the section that the conservation regulations tend to concentrate. Make the mesh big enough for small fish to escape through it. In the North Sea, the minimum mesh size is 100 millimetres. But if the action of pulling the trawl along closes the mesh like this, then we're back at square one. If we make the mesh bigger still, even more young fish could escape, but this wouldn't be popular with everybody. Whiting fishermen can quite legally catch fish this size, so obviously they want to use a smaller mesh. It's double four millimeter twine. Now they use this, which makes extremely robust cod ends. It's double six millimeter twine. It's thicker, heavier, stiffer, so it doesn't open quite so easily. The marine lab researchers have compared the selectivity of the two and, not surprisingly, this is much worse than this. It's a real conservation problem. Obviously, what the scientists need to see is what happens to the net when it's actually in the water. To do this, they use an underwater vehicle. It's controlled from here on board and sends pictures back up so we can see how effectively the gear's working or not working, as the case may be. Let's check out the net and see what's going on. Well, this looks pretty good. There are enough open meshes in the cod end here to let the smaller fish escape. The number of meshes in the netting panels is one of the factors involved in keeping them open or closed. The more meshes there are, the less each one opens and the net is less selective. But if you do the opposite and have fewer meshes, they'll stay open. In fact, cod ends for cod and haddock can't really be too narrow, as they have to be strong enough to lift the catch. They can legally have up to 100 open meshes round them. Perhaps the cheapest and easiest way to keep the meshes open is to lace on short ropes to stop the cod ends stretching lengthwise. It lets the smaller fish escape, but it doesn't weaken the net in any way. It's been tried quite successfully in Canada, and it's hard to see why fishermen seem to prefer more complicated methods. How about this though? If we turn the mesh so that it's square, it should stay open. When this idea first came out, folk thought it was pretty good. Putting panels of square mesh into nets would let all the small fish out and keep all the big ones in. Unfortunately, life isn't like that. Panels can work, but they don't all of the time and they need a bit of help. The Marine Lab's researchers found that fish only go out through a panel if they think it's less risky than staying in the net and drifting back to the cod end. That's where the black tunnel idea came from. The Aberdeen team fitted it immediately behind the square mesh panel. It's a strong visual stimulus for the fish. It encourages them to escape and makes square mesh panels much more efficient. Which is great in the daylight, but what happens when it's dark? Fish, just like us, bump into things. They hit the netting, rush about at random, and escaping through the meshes is very much hit and miss. Okay, you can turn the light back on now. Another factor is the speed at which you tow. 
The best place for the panel is as far back as possible, right in the cod end. Even there though, to get out through it, fish have to swim very hard, and the faster the net's going, the harder it is. It was fishermen in the Baltic who came up with the idea of another type of escape panel for cod fishing. These panels go on the sides of the cod end, and there are two kinds, the Danish with square mesh, and the Swedish with stiffened diamond mesh. The Swedish one goes much further into the cod end and works better. The trouble is that fish don't line up in convenient little corridors labelled cod only or whiting one-way street. On the same fishing grounds in the North Sea, you'll get many different species. So to conserve those most at risk, we have to be able to differentiate between, say, this prawn and this haddock underwater. So far, we've been talking about nets designed to release small fish of all species. Sometimes we have to separate them in the net, though, so we can release those that are most at risk. Fisheries in Norway, Canada, the USA and Australia are now using separating grids. The idea came from the shrimp fisheries, which use nets with small mesh cod ends. They were catching and having to discard lots of small fish, so they put grids into nets to divert fish to escape holes. The grids are angled to the flow and steer most fish out. Shrimp, on the other hand, just drift through the bars and they're caught. Good separation depends on getting the angle right between the grid and the flow. There's been a lot of work developing grids for different fisheries. Flexible, multi-section, flat and round. In specific fisheries in some countries, grids are now compulsory. Like everything else though, there can be problems, like getting clogged up with weed, skate and jellyfish. The Norwegians noticed that grids could also separate fish by size. They mounted them in the top of the net and left the cod end clear. They're still angled to make sure that most fish have a chance to escape. You can also use square mesh panels to separate species. They're compulsory in the prawn fishery and young haddock and whiting can escape through 80 millimeter mesh. In Ireland, where they use old style low nets for prawns, they put the panel further forward in the net which works, although nobody is quite sure why. It's obvious that if fish are being herded, they'll get tired. Eventually, they'll just give up and fall back into the net. Researchers watched this happening and noticed that whiting and haddock tended to rise to up in the net, whilst prawns, cod and flatfish tended to stay low. These observations produced another technique for separating species called, surprise, surprise, the separator trawl. It's got an extra horizontal panel inside to keep the species apart and leads to two separate cod ends. It can also be used in the cod fishery with big mesh in the lower cod end to release the young cod. The design works very well, but it's more expensive to make. The French have tried it in their nephrops fishery to release small hake. In 1997, the EU brought out new legislation which took some of these ideas on board and applied them. Other countries have gone further. Norwegian fishermen in northern waters have to use whole square mesh cod ends when discard rates rise. Fishing methods keep on developing. There's no doubt that thick twine cod ends are a backward step as far as conservation goes. Escape panels won't compensate for this change unless they're right in the cod end. There's certainly a future for grids in many fisheries, but they need to be carefully designed like the separator. Let's think about this though. If we reduce discards, we're bound to reduce the number of marketable fish we catch, and this will be reflected right away in our fishermen's wage packets. We're talking economics. Conservation measures which are biologically sound, but which fail to take into account the economic effect they're going to have, usually always fail. From the work of the marine laboratory and others, the tools are in place for conserving future fish stocks and reducing discards, if we choose to use them. But whatever way we look at it, it has to make sense to protect the future.